Great. Hi, and welcome to this Facebook Live broadcast from the Magnificent Park of the British Council for Madrid. And um, we are here with Victoria Molesta. Hi, Victoria. Hi. Uh, and uh, before we get a little bit of context, yesterday uh, Victoria um, closed the Migale de Ferente and Migale de Ferente Festival at the Temple of the Mountain Final, which is the Spanish National Theatre here in Madrid. A week long festival which is dedicated to um, arts, disability, arts and arts and disability. The World Festival has grown over the, the three editions um, and is, is now really a, a mainstream festival with this particular focus. And uh, the British Council is very much involved in the initiation of this festival and also in something called the Jornadas, the Institutions of Gatlin, the Tapas also started by the uh, by the Spanish Ministry of Culture a few years ago with the British Council. So it's an area of British Council very much involved in over the years. Victoria, welcome to Spain. Do you have any, any background, any history in Spain for the first time? How long do you know that? Uh, maybe probably six times or so. Um, I I always forget how beautiful it is. Uh, maybe it, this is maybe my third time here and I haven't bought any books, it's definitely the first time. And uh, the Madrid audience definitely did, did disappoint. They were very welcoming. You know, the attendance was uh, fantastic. So um, I definitely love Spain a lot. And uh, I just haven't quite had, I tend to over the years just travel when I'm working somewhere. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I think I just haven't had enough opportunity to work here before. So it was really great. You yourself were born in Latvia, which I should explain because in Spanish there's always this confusion between the I don't even know what it's called in English. Exactly, which is it's actually, it's actually in Letonia, which is strange oh. because the, the name doesn't sound. In the, in well, it sounds English. more like Lithuania, yeah. ironically. Yeah. So, what is Lithuania? Lithuania. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So, you have Estonia, Lithuania, and okay. Letonia, and Latvia, and English is Letonia. <laughs> I'm sure there's probably kind of Roman reason for this. I don't know what it is. So um, you moved to the UK when you were four years old. And um, how, how do you feel? Do you feel 100% British? Do you still feel kind of mixed? Or do you feel both or neither? Um, I'd say I definitely feel 100% British. Um, I think, you know, I had a very unusual sort of circumstances where I was born in that year when it was still the USSR. So kind of, you know, that entire region is culturally, it's just so many difficulties there because, you know, you had a situation where people from every different country were spread around and sent and were ran, you know, during the war and stuff. So it's really mixed up. And then, you know, unfortunately, when that big gained independence, um, it was pretty much like we hate the Russians because you just ruined our life. So I was kind of in Latvia, speaking Russian, living in a single big city, Dalgonville, which was still mostly Russian, and um, you know it was really difficult. I think I think that uh, that together with the sort of society society's attitude towards the fact that you know you weren't particularly you weren't one hundred percent healthy, and I was Russian, speaking with mixed parents, Russian and Latvian. I mean. You know, by the time I came to London, I was like, okay, this is, this is the, you know, UK is the country. I was like, as long as I fully kind of just absorb the culture and learn the language and, you know, do my kind of bit, then actually I feel like this is somewhere where I can feel pretty at home. And that was definitely the case. And I think that, um, you know, um, I'm kind of almost overly patriotic about the UK just just for that reason because you know um, it is when you put in the effort with the culture you know you really you know you really can call it home I don't know if you call it home since Brexit I have to say I'm, I'm having second exactly thoughts I'm living in Mexican City at the moment I'm like mm. <laughs> but I'm coming to vote so it'll be days. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to ask you actually about um, 
how you think Brexit already is and will affect culture and the arts particularly? Well, I think that, you know, if anything, I just, I find, I'm a little bit embarrassed about what's going on in the UK, you know, and, and, and but it's, um, it's interesting that, um, we're just having a chat on the way here, that um, there is, I do believe it's a very tough time for uh, general creativity in the UK. Um, even though, you know, I think that there are, you know, a couple of isolated cases where, you know, there's still people really trying to bring some life into it. But on a whole, I think the level of negativity and cynicism towards creativity and referen sort of referential attitude of how everything's been done and nothing new and etc. I, I have definitely found in the last few years the attitude of the UK has sort of become like just you know not not fertile for for creativity. Um, but I think um, you know like whenever that sort of thing happens there has to be a breaking point of where actually everybody has enough and there's fresh energy. So I'm staying optimistic, but I think definitely, definitely comparing to other countries at the moment, it's, 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 there's a little bit of a damper about it, I would say. Going back in time to when you first moved to the UK, age 12, and um, you spent 12 years of your life in that year, maybe you think of something of the difference, of the, the physical disability of the then might have imposed. And then you moved to a country with a different language, a different accent, a different culture. How difficult was that period uh, immediately after you got there to sort of assimilation and feeling part of what you thought your own identity was back then? Um, it was definitely really hard for like a while, you know. Um, I think that, um, you know, it took a moment to get a sense of the amount of diversity that, that was happening in London, you know, because I initially came that I didn't speak a word of English <laughs> and I definitely didn't know anybody. So, you know, I think it, it took a while for me to even try to like navigate what was happening. But you know, there is this irony where, you know, when I lived in Latvia, I spent probably my six years on and off living in a hospital. And at the time I was like, oh, Come on, you know, it's really hindered my social skills and et cetera, et cetera. But really, I think it's the thing that sort of saved me from being kind of brainwashed by the really kind of backwards, really sort of repressed society that was happening at the time. So when I arrived and loved it, I just had no rules or boundaries in my head. I was like, oh, I'm going to this. This is a new playground. And, you know, and there is definitely there are definitely benefits of not being restrained by uh, educational or economic um, whatever boundaries. Um, I think you know it's been a very uh, it's had a very positive effect on, on my general kind of like life and career and stuff. Just turning up to London and being kind of like, well, I can try everything and I should try everything and everything's fine, and, you know and that kind of, I think it bred this very open-minded view towards culture, generally, you know, and it's really um, manifesting now, much later on, where, you know, I'm working with uh, scientists and, you know, and, and people who work in, you know, tech innovation and high art, but also, like, high fashion and pop culture, etc. So I just, like, Take it all and make my own thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, I definitely want to move on to those areas in just one minute. I'm still fascinated by by this, um, by what it meant for you, this change. If you'd stayed in that, what would you have done with your creativity? Absolutely no idea. I, I don't think I would have stayed in that yet. Probably maybe until I was like 16 or something. I don't know. Um, but I think, you know, it's, um, it's fascinating that literally. Even now, you know, if anyone from my long distance family hears about anything, you know, for years, you know, uh, rest in peace, my, my brother, that's, you know, when, um, maybe like five years ago or something, when I called her, they'd be like, so, what are you doing? You know, what are you, what's, what's your job? And it's like, well, you 
you know, um, did this photo shoot and then like doing good music and then like working with this person and working with that person and then some of the bad stuff. And then they would just sit there and be like, what do you do? Like, what do you do for a job? And I'm like, this is my job. And you know, and it's fascinating that obviously the capital cities, like now, you know, in Russia and or at least in Europe, you know, wait, Northern Europe now, okay? But, <laughs> um, you know, they really, um, you know, there's a lot more progress and a lot, you know, but the really majority of places, you know, really still it's like you grow up, you go and work in IT or banking or law or, or if you didn't get your high education then, you know, you'd be working as a secretary or in the shop floor. There's really not much choice. Um, so, you know, to answer your question, I have absolutely no idea, you know, because in, in all of the period that I spent um, staying in hospital and feeling pretty sort of secluded, you know, one of my biggest guidances in life was like Disney, you know, <laughs> and I grew up thinking, well, this kind of sucks, but I guess if you use your imagination and apply it with intention to creating your own environment, your own um, sort of identity, your own image, whatever it is you want to do, you know, it looks like it could be really fun, you know, and um, thank God for Disney. <laughs> so when did your relationship with music begin? Um, at a very young age, actually. Um, I have a love and hate relationship with music, actually. I don't know why. It's been one of the most difficult sort of, like, things for me where, um, Amongst the time in a hospital, I went to the boarding arts school for like maybe three years on and off here and there. And uh, I learned sheet music and piano, and I was like a singer in the new band, a uh, girl band that they had, sort of you know, performed during Christmas or whatever. And then you know, by the time I got to like maybe age nine, I was like, well, who wants to? stay at home and <laughs> do all this homework. I was always like, I was always, um, it's interesting, you know, what covered entering MIT Media Lab for the first time. It was the first time where I've ever been to an academic environment where, you know, the study is based on uh, practical learning. And I was like, oh my God, I've been doing this forever, but I just didn't know. You know, I was like, I never felt that curriculum for me was the right decision, you know, I was always, I wanted to get in there and learn as I went along. So, uh, you know, so actually, I was like, actually music is super boring, and I was like, I'm not into it, and I don't know about this, and then only when I sort of got to him at the age of 15, and I started working a bit of fa with fashion, and a bit of art here and there, and I was like, actually, I, was like, I want to get back into vocal lessons, etc, etc, and by, I think by the age of 20, I kind of started really working with some um, producers and stuff, and I was quite lucky actually that in London, I ended up totally by coincidence bumping into a couple of mentors that really encouraged um, songwriting and, and music, and it's only years later that I realized that they were mentors, because I didn't really know that anyway. Understand the concept of a mentor before that, to be honest. Um, and but it's like it's was what was interesting is that um, the whole period from like the age of fourteen to twenty, I didn't understand why I was jumping from one thing to another. I mean, I literally wanted to know everything. I wanted to know how to retouch images, how to make a website, how to mix a track, how to write lyrics. I just I was just like give it all to me. And by the time I started working with uh, my first formal music partner, I was like, this is what it's all for, because what I really wanted to do is, you know, until I get to the point where I can have a great team working with me, I wanted to be able to orchestrate an entire sort of vision, an entire capsule of work where, you know, I could find two more elements and later on, you know, now it's like I still oversee absolutely everything. 
but I now work with people where I know exactly what skills they have and I just let them work with it, you know, whether it's whatever medium they're working with. So music has been I think a lot of people, uh, especially after the prototype video, has sort of, you know, there's been a sense of, you know, pop star and blah, 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 all this stuff. And I think, you know, um, my, my latest understanding of my relationship with music is that it's a soundtrack to my overall story and my, like, my own kind of Disney story of what I'm doing, really. Um, and, um, you know, it kind of, it glues everything together, I think. And as you mentioned, your own career is, is the sum of all of its parts of, of music, but also of fashion and technology. And, and, and how, um, how did the, the fashion um, begin? How did you get a great right, begin going down that route? Um, to be honest, I think it's, um, from a very, very young age, I was absolutely obsessed with fashion. And and I think one of the things that I did when I came to London was um, I would spend maybe six months to a year in a different type of city. I mean, I literally tried everything. And I just really wanted to try and understand what drives people. Why do they listen to this type of music? dressed like this and the whole ideology like where does it stem from and you know and I just kind of I got, I got really deep into that because I was really really fascinated and you know probably from the age of 15 you know that's when I started sort of discovering a lot more about God fashion and performance art you know work with Matthew Barney and obviously it's like the queen at the time and just really you know and I think um now, I think everything to do with fashion for me is um, I'll just pick and choose parts from every type of cultural reference that has ever ticked it for me, you know. And, and I think also like taking the best parts, you know, taking the best parts of, um, you know, old Hollywood glamour, but also futurism and 80s and, you know, and just making up your own kind of, kind of story. But most importantly, I think that. I've always seen fashion as more frivolous thing. I think that uh, as someone who was going through that period where, you know, my teenage years before I had my um, before I had my amputation, it was like, you know, I really needed to to sort of compensate for myself in a way of what uh, you know how the rest of me was presented. And I think that, that was the time when I really realized the power of fashion, which is ultimately design. You know, you're redesigning your silhouette, you're changing, you know, putting your shoulder pads or tucking your waist, whatever, you know. And, and I think that once you experience that power of looking into the room and how different type of fashion affects how you feel and how someone else feels next to you about you, you know, to me, I was like, perfect, you know, this is, this is a way of play, of transformation, of being able to play the character. Um, but fashion, more recently, has a lot of, a lot of mediums for me emerging into the same thing at the moment. You know, working with 3D printed technology of being able to create more uh, silhouette transform pieces being able to you know mix that in with it being a musical instrument you know or working even you know the spike leg design the, you know that I design it's like the power of being able to transform and change you know really it's fascinating you mentioned the work that you do at uh, MIT media lab can you explain a bit more about what that what that's involved with involves? Sure, I mean totally to um, my biggest shock, um, you know, two years ago I started my uh, director's fellowship there and you know, I, I'd say that um, outside of all the successful parts that I've had in my career, 
that's definitely the one that kind of blew, blew me away. You know, someone who's gone to, you know, so the less than two years of education in my life officially, you know, become a director of the media lab. I had no idea what I was getting myself into when I got there. And then, would you want to be a director of fellow? And I was like, sure. And everybody was like, oh my god, I can't believe you got asked to do that. You know? But um, I mean, since I've been there, um, I mean, one of my biggest projects there has been with uh, the Graphic Performance Lab. And that was the initial way of how I invited and working with Professor uh, Hugh Kerr of Extreme Bionics. I suppose he's the leading um, developer in that whole world of looking at um, different ways of rebuilding the body. I mean, he does so much work. Uh, his main work has been mostly about uh, creating bionic artificial lids that are kind of powered by motor and computer and stuff. So, you know, he's really going into kind of robotics. But also other stuff, you know, like trying to build uh, an artificial nervous system to, like there's a lot of, there's a lot of really amazing work that they do. So one of my main collaborations has been with him and um, just, I think he's one of very few people in the world who's, um, he's actually a, a double below the amputee. He had a, um, he was an extreme climber when he was younger and uh, that's the accident. But anyway, so then he was just like, Hey, it's a crazy badass future professor. <laughs> and, um, but he's probably one of the very few people in the world that I've met um, who shares my feelings about working with prosthetics and generally how, how this whole categorization of medical devices or lifestyle devices, consumer devices, is actually it's very temporary. I think that when you get into um, get to know the world of technology and science more globally, you start to understand how there is really not really much difference in about five, ten years' time between what type of technology you're wearing, whether it's helping you walk, whether it's helping you navigate your way around the city. Um, but outside of MIT Media Lab, um, the last year, um, I've really sort of been working closely with a lot of uh, the kind of futurists and technology sort of community, um, and a lot of a lot of very new type of art where it has a very technological sort of feeling, but also a lot of uh, multidisciplinary approaches. You know, people people who are working in fashion, but are also coders and or, you know, uh, it is, it's become incredibly blurred, and I think that that's been my most favorite work recently. Um, I did a performance just at the end of last year on Basel, and um, a series of performances, and it was fascinating. We had a 3D printed uh, first year that had tusks coming out of my body, and it was incredible because so many things were ticked. It was changing my anatomy. There were music sensors on the tasks that I played, played as an instrument, and it was accompanied by a 3D printed mini orchestra with uh, titanium violins. And you know, but we also threw in um, uh, a dance producer from uh, Los Angeles who orchestrated it, and you know, we were both. Uh, um, a, a, a symphony ball. So it was, um, you know, I think that's that kind of mind bending, physically transforming, performance transforming sort of experience is kind of like that's been on fire recently because I think since, since kind of, you know, putting a good dent into the work with. Um, aesthetics and the general kind of like image of that, you know, finding out what the future of performance is for me has been key. I think you know, they're just probably by the way that we've got time for the for a questions. Okay. But um, I think from what you've already said that you've answered this question, I still want to ask it anyway. 
and perform literature in the context of, uh, of an arts invisibility festival. Obviously, your world famous performance at the uh, Paralympic Games in 2012 was seen by a number of billion people around the world. Um, you've already talked about blurring these boundaries between different genres and different areas of the arts, and different technology, and different areas of life and lifestyle and fashion. Um, how much work is there still to do in blurring the boundaries between disability and non disability? Uh, and how important is it still to have this today because specifically the disability art? Um, well, I think that it's incredibly important um, because it's something that I'll be really honest, when the Paralympics happened, I had absolutely no idea what Paralympics were. I got asked to, to be in a ceremony, and they were like, we're looking for a snow queen, and we hear that you were sitting, so I was like, sure. I was like, that's cool. You know, um, I mean, one of the reasons why, um, you know, why uh, I worked on a prototype project with uh, what's commissioned by Channel 4, or the Go Risky campaign, was that after the Paralympics, there was such a huge sense of how empty the cultural space was when it came to anyone in the currently named category of disability. I found it just astonishing. I, I found it astonishing to arrive at the Paralympic Games and feel like people were making me like I was an alien because I was really interested in, yeah, I felt really comfortable with myself and I was putting it into a performance state and we had the, the Swarovski diamond deck that we had commissioned in a full costume and all this stuff and people were just like, oh my god, you're an amputee woman and you seem to be very enjoying it and you seem to have taken it and pushed it, put it somewhere else and, and I was like, well, you know, I kind of felt almost a sense of sort of, well, maybe I should just do it because no one seems to be doing it, so why don't I do it? And then when Channel 4 got in touch with me, you know, they were like, with that Victoria, they were like, we were looking at, you know, into this post Paralympics, and they just, they just found almost no creative work out there that, that was done to high standard that they could feature, and I couldn't believe it. You know, I really couldn't believe it. And I think there's been a lot of progress in the last few years. And it's wonderful. And I think that, you know, festivals like this should definitely exist and should definitely keep creating a platform. Because I think the biggest problem is getting the support for those type of people to actually develop their skills and to actually have the opportunity to enter the worldwide stage. You know, I'm a little bit of an anomaly where I sort of did it on my own and I was kind of like, well, no one is doing it, but I feel like this is the right thing. Um, and I think my relationship towards um, that whole issue is that what I'm fascinated is, you know, what I'm concentrating on is what do I, you know, what do we do after everyone's already accepted it and it's normalized? I'm interested in the post-disability um, idea and a post, always oh, kind of post-humanity, post-disability idea of what happens when everybody's got their head around it and it's normalized. How do we function, you know, as a more futuristic human beings, you know, because I think that I just don't see it's the perspective that I have for me personally that I find most different and sometimes, you know. And do I believe that, you know, um, events only specialized for disabled people will be the ones that will change ultimately the, the cultural landscape globally? The answer is probably no. I think that it should take individuals who have, who have had the support, who have had encouragement to do a really goddamn good job going out in the world and ultimately you're still competing amongst 
the worldwide stage. I think getting the resources and support is key. But it's, you know, like when I do anything, I'm not expecting preferential treatment. Yes, I definitely have turned it around and made it kind of astray and all of that stuff. But um, I think that it's, you know, for normalization to happen, you have to be able to go out there on your own and do a really, really great job at something, you know. So. And that's exactly what you're, you're doing. I always feel with a, a short interview like this that we've been scratching the surface. So if anybody watching, we're going to be here. Uh, there's a massive audience on it, but you can't see if you walk into Facebook Live, but we're in front of 50,000 people live here. <laughs> and um, if you do want to find out more about uh, Victoria, then uh, where you can start, if you like, at the British Council's own site, British Council. Got e Virgo Esther uh, Sierra. Victoria's website is Victoria okay, Modesta dot com. Is it .com? Yeah, dot com. And um, your EP Counterflows came out at the Counter end. Flow. Counterflow. Yes. Came out at the end of um, of 2016. Yeah. Um, and I was going to ask you all about that, but I think we're probably out of time, so you can discover that for yourselves if you haven't already. Um, and I think, finally, to ask you, where do you think you'll be at, say, in 10 years' time, where we'll all be in 10 years' time, culturally, in the midst of all the things we've mentioned before about Brexit, about technological advances, about changes in the way we think, the attitudes that we have, where do you see yourself? Where would you want to be? Where are your ambitions? Well, more of a broad question, you said that you asked about, I think that there is definitely some very extreme bubbling happening in the world. There's the political climate, there's, there is also the tech and science kind of revolution that's happening. I think that one of the things that fascinates me about it is that I do think that ultimately it's bringing us together and it's kind of evening out the differences between us somehow. Um, you know, starting from the internet, with how the fact that you, know, you could be anyone with whatever amount of legs and eyes and <laughs> whatever else, you know, timing way to someone from another country and, you know, it, it gives people a voice of being able just to be whatever it is that they're saying, you know. Um, but um, I, I, I definitely believe that there is, um, you know, especially, I think that this is one time that this year I've been feeling really sort of excited about being a woman in this particular time because I think that as women, someone sent me this great article the other day about sort of uh, the future of women, women, uh, the history of women and I think that it's funny because what it was talking about is that, you know, there isn't that much great stuff to look back upon as women, you know, whichever would you pick me like, oh damn. Really like, I really wish I was alive during that time, you know, in terms of rights and everything else. And I think that there is just such an amazing opportunity at the moment to really kind of create our own sort of future as women at the moment, how we want it to be, you know, the opportunity is absolutely here. Um, I'd like to think that I just keep doing more of all the things that I'm doing, but to a much more advanced level, you know. The more recent stuff, you know, having like secret conversations with people that work in working on space projects and you know, just I hope to just create as much magic in the real world as possible. So you've already given us quite a lot of magic to performances today and this talk yesterday. Thank you. Thank you so much.